please support this channel by subscribing and leaving comments. Stay well, stay safe.
We went up the railroad tracks and down through the uh, bush, across the two fields and into the woods. And uh, it was starting to get dark and we had to figure out a place to camp kind of quick like because we didn't have a flashlight with us. And we decided on, on an area that is next to a uh, right at the edge of a swamp. And um, we sat uh, down in the camp. One of the boys uh, commenced to make a fire. We had a German Shepherd with us. And um, we sat up maybe for uh, two hours and, and talked. And, and we had uh, hot dogs and beans with us and we cooked over the fire. And uh, we were running out of things to put on the fire. And one of the boys had already just about fallen asleep already. So we, and the fire had went down. So we figured that we would just go to sleep, wait till next morning. But when uh, the German Shepherd started to get edgy and, and started to uh, have whimper under his throat, his nose was pointing uh, towards the swamp. And, and he said something coming. And it was real alert. He was pricked up. And I noticed that everything was quiet. And all of a sudden, we heard uh, something come across the swamp. Something on two legs. The dead of two, two steps. Um, it, it kept coming. The dog got real edgy. The first stood up. Uh, whatever it was, was coming closer. I don't know what we thought then, uh, if it was a bear, we figured it wouldn't be a human being uh, back where we were, because it's a part of the woods where it was very untraveled. Um, and all of a sudden, the steps, the two steps just kept coming along when uh, the dog rushed out into the swamp. It wasn't too far from where we were situated, and uh, we heard a lot of growling, a lot of noise, and the dog was thrown over the underbrush, which was about at least seven feet high. The dog was thrown over the top of it and ran almost right back into the campfire. It knocked the dog out, and I know that there was blood out of his nose. There was Our eyes were now glued on the... Um, the brush, and there was a few more steps when, when whatever it was stopped, and uh, the dog had woke up. The dog was refusing to go back on, on the second attack. I told the boys, it spoke the boys, um, I told them to take some of the sticks out of the campfire and start tossing them towards where the whatever had stopped. And apparently one of the fire, the fire sticks had hit this creature, whatever it was, because it heard a, a horrendous sound. And then uh, made a, a language, a voice, something that uh, sounded really deep and heavy, something like a human. Not, uh, not, uh, not a language that we knew. But, um, the boys were terrified. Well, uh, two of them wouldn't, wouldn't uh, refuse to even look towards the bridge. And they were buried in their sleeping bags. One of the boys um, was crying. We had to wait it out there. there. There was just that long pause that seemed like minutes, and it might have been, that we knew it was praying and it was still the brush. Well, I didn't want to see whatever it was, and, 
and all of a sudden it, it stood up and it turned and I got a picture of the, of the side of its face and it wasn't there and it wasn't a human and it was a giant hair covered creature from the, from the shore itself And, 
I didn't see a face on it or anything, but I scampered up the bank to use big fine maples to pull it up with. And uh, it's hard to say that, you know, yeah, I've seen it before, but I, I did. I, I never expected to see it. I didn't go out to, to look for it. I was tra trout fishing. But in my honest opinion, I think I saw it scamper up the bank. Because um, I got a glimpse of that, and, and the feet shown in the back of it, and it kept his arms in front of it, and his head was lowered, and it went up the bank so quick. You could count to maybe almost <coughs> three, and, uh, and I got out of there um, fast, but I wanted to see what, what it was, and there was a clearing up above, and I went up there to look, and there was nothing around. It, it kicked rocks up as it went up the bank, and I saw the wind made this moving back and forth. On the tape, I think you, you said that it spoke some kind of a language that you couldn't understand, so that effect. Will you elaborate on that? Well, I, <clears throat> what I got out of it was that if there was a warning in that voice, we were throwing the fire sticks at it. And it was like saying, you know, voice inside said, you know, just stop. We knew we weren't going to get it away from us. Uh, but it was like a human language. It was a human-like voice. It looked like a growl from a bear. And bears make some sounds that sound a little bit like uh, strange. You know, they make other sounds other than me. But it wasn't like that. It was, it was just a human voice, and I just, um, it just added to the, to the uh, fear that was there. And there was a lot of it, uh, like fear. We just wanted to get out. We just wanted to get out real quick. How old were the other boys? Who, who were the other boys? How old? How old? 11, 12, and 13. So you were the oldest, so you were considered responsible? Yes, I was. I was considered responsible. There's uh, a boy named uh, Johnny Schoenmaker, David Schoenmaker, and Jerry Dickinson, and myself. How did their parents react to what they said? Well, their parents were, were just, I don't know if they said anything to do with it, but they were strict Catholics, Roman Catholic. And they told me that those boys would never associate with me again, that I was just trying to scare them out of the woods. And they, they made sure that they were strict, and they made sure that those boys did not associate with me again. I was just trying to scare them out of the woods, so they broke up a friendship between me and the boys. Uh, not a friendship, but a, a, a getting together at times that we we used to go out in the woods quite a bit, and uh, and I have pictures of uh, <clears throat> you know two, three more years out there with them doing things. When we talked around the campfire, it wasn't any spooky stories at night. It was where we where we were going to go the next day, and uh, kind of an adventure. <laughs> but that ended that adventure. The adventure we had that night ended our plans for. And in the parts of the woods, nobody had gone to them. And they would suggest how you could have been responsible for this? No, nobody ever did. After that time, after that time, I started following those dogs missing in the woods. Oh, the little carrier types that went out pursued to the end. And I found two of those dogs. Uh, were dead, blood was killed. And one of them I picked up had a broken neck. I knew the dog, it, it belonged to one of the people I knew. I reported that um, I found two of the dogs, and so people formed a little posse around the neighborhood and went down in there trying to catch some guy that was massacring dogs. And uh, the boys knew, they knew what it was. 
they, they knew it wasn't a bear and it wasn't a man, and that's all there is to it. And uh, I don't know. I just don't. What time of the year was it? It was midsummer, and the time of uh, night was uh, oh after dark. We sat around talking a couple of hours. No, I'm trying to figure out whether it was late summer or fall. So I was listening to it, I thought it was the moon study. Uh, I would say it would be in, in J July. I marked it down in my notes. My brother took, um, I, right after this thing happened here, this uh, terrifying experience, uh, and I wasn't believed, they made me go back and um, try to get the, the gear that the boys it left behind, and uh, they left that up to me. Uh, pick up all their camping gear and bring it home. So I put in most, I went back, it took me a lot of courage to go back. And uh, I found out it was just as spooky there in the daytime as it was when I was there at night. I, I felt that something was watching me. And um, I picked up uh, a lot of gear, threw it in the sleep with my sleep bag. And, uh, Carried it uh, there are different routes and I came in that, that night with the encounter. But uh, when I brought uh, all the articles that I could get in the bag back, uh, I don't want to go back and get some of the shoes that were left there that I didn't get. And some days I'm not and everything else. But, uh, it, it was just too terrifying to go back here again. I, I had to really build it. <coughs> I timed it at two weeks, and I wrote all this stuff down, all this stuff that I would do and go back. And, you know, I went back uh, one of the days and found the uh, big holes in the swamp, you know, where he stepped in the swamp. No no tracks, but just holes that were left in the swamp, two steps, holes. And um, I think that the, the people, uh, that were ridiculing the living uh, heck out of me were, um, were also responsible for uh, the missing notes and the missing reports that I had back then. Uh, I really wanted to set out the truth so bad to everybody that, that what I told them was, was the truth. Um, but that didn't happen. And, uh, but the good thing that happened is that Bigfoot, the name Bigfoot, came came about a few years later. You started hearing that word Bigfoot. And uh, I think the greatest thing that happened was uh, 1967 when a, when a film was taken down in Wilkesbury, California. And, and then people started saying, well, hey, maybe this thing does exist. Maybe there is something out there. And then that made me feel a lot better. And then my dad showed me a newspaper where this came out and uh, and uh, he told me that <coughs> that there could uh, I believe there could be something to this. And that made me feel really good. Really, I, I had never liked my dad before that I could I had a reputation of, of not lying, and my, my three brothers had a reputation of uh, storytelling. Um, I didn't, and uh, I was pretty proud of that, and it, and it really crushed me when uh, I wasn't really. It still does. Uh, two quick ones. Did your previous question, or did you mention? Possibility of moose, sir? Did I hear you right? Oh, uh, yeah. Moose don't occur in western Washington. They're only in the extreme northeastern corner of Washington. It's not in their historic range. So that's uh, But I wanted to ask you uh, if you wanted to say anything about Bigfoot Central and what the activities of Bigfoot Central are. Well, actually, it's a report center for North America. We get calls from all over the United States, parts of Canada. And it's amazing how many calls we do get and how, how much seriousness there is in, in Bigfoot and the Sasquatch. 
And um, we take everybody's reports uh, very seriously. There's a lot of crackpots out there, and maybe about 90% of the people, it comes down to that, are, um, are just full baloney. But then there's other ones that you just, um, there's no way to discredit what they have um, seen, maybe encountered. And when you go to a track find report, you can't find any way that man was, had the capability of uh, leaving those tracks or passage sign in the woods. You get kind of real savvy out there on, on hoaxes because people are so very clever. But when they don't leave the mark and there's no human sign in the area, no mark of a hoax, and you get a real deep impression in the ground and you get uh, some of the, the tracks that coincide or mesh with those uh, tracks that we believe are real, then and we think that uh, there are people that are citing them to this day. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. We, we published a newsletter called Bigfoot Trails that keeps you informed on the updated on, on reports and some of the people that are out there pursuing Bigfoot and uh, And so Carol wanted to mention that. Do you have copies of that here? Well, thank you, Cliff. One last, one last uh, question. What are you planning to do with the information? What are your long-term goals? Or do you have any? Or are you just gathering information for what purpose? I'm gathering mostly the information that I believe is significant to the Sasquatch and not not the jump, not the baloney. And that information, when it's compiled, I share it with uh, some of my partners in this research. And right now, uh, I plan to, I'm one of the few people that have never published a book, written a book. And I think I will we'll share the information in a book at one time. When the time is right, I'll do it. For 38 years now, off and on, and sometimes more, some years more than others, I've been very deeply and heavily involved in this. And I'm the guy that gets out in the woods and really gets out there and stays. And, and, and I love the woods. And I think that uh, it takes that instead of some guy that just wants to go on to them, no, they can go back. But I do have some plans uh, with um, distribution of that information that I would like to disclose right now. Uh, but, but mainly, I think I would like to share with people and, uh, so that they're aware of. Uh, even if they are cynical, what if, if they are very cynical, what if it does exist? Maybe it will prefer them in case they do have an encounter with these creatures. Okay. Any last questions? Yes, I can. You know, it's like you're 16 years at the time. Uh, 16 years today. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to go back in the woods to go back to the rest of the camping here in the past. Yeah. Uh,
You know, you're right. You always kind of true, uh, very true. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I've known forgiven for it. It was a cutting error. It really was. He was a, a little feisty guy, something like that. Little guy back there in the chair. He had to wait. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
they're still having this isn't something that happened back in the 50s or 60s or 70s. And as early as this last year, um, people have still been seeing Sasquatch on Grace Harbor. Um, let's see, the latest I know was in August of last year. There was a gal, she and her husband had gone fishing in the Pinal River, and they were in the boat in the water, and they looked out and Sasquatch had come down to the edge of the river. And uh, I called and talked to this woman at the time. <coughs> the child was very ill and was taken in to see out cancer treatment. Breathing stress, and she said, I prefer not to talk about it. But it hasn't stopped. And um, to just kind of give you an idea of some of the experiences, uh, there's one lady in Home Tulips, an elderly woman, who called and was terrifically amused that I was interested because to her, um, this is a fellow who comes through and gets into the garbage can on a yearly basis, and she thinks he's a riot. He comes and he just strews things all over and turns all the neighborhoods as he walks through, the lights automatically come on down the street. And she said, there's one dog who's absolutely obnoxious in the neighborhood, but when Sasquatch shows up, he comes up and starts wagging his tail, because he knows who it is. He comes along, he's been coming around for years. <laughs> so she thought it was wonderful. And um, in contrast to that, there was a young man that called me from Northrop, a boy, a teenager, who uh, told me that he had gone crawfish hunting in this river in North River. And he said that um, he had a whole handful of, of these crawdads, I don't know if they're crawfish or crawdads, and he was bent down getting them, and he happened to look up, and this, he said, I, I looked up, and there's a creature that was white that was down the bank for me that was just squatting there, staring at me. He said, I stood up and shot the, the crawdads, and when I screamed, he stood up, and he took off in one direction, and I shot off in the other one. And he said, and the worst thing that happened to this is I just purchased a $25 pirate's cat, and I lost it. He said, I, I took off running, I ran and got on my motorcycle, and I went home, and he said, I, I was just terrified. But he was someone else who never told me. But he asked a friend if a friend had ever heard of Sasquatch and believed in it. And when the friend laughed at him, he didn't say anything else. He said, I never told my mother. But all these, there were so many stories like this that came in. And uh, the one more that I'll mention, and then I'll introduce Fred Bradshaw. Fred was kind enough to talk to me. He and his stepsister had both had experiences with Sasquatch. Harvard. And after he was another one of those to check me out and find out what business was in mine, he could find out about Sasquatch anyway, that he was kind enough to share his story, which was put in the articles in the book. And of course, it's here today because I would much rather, rather than me tell you what I found out, that someone who's experienced Sasquatch telling you stuff. But um, the one last thing I'm going to tell you was that there was a Cornell Indian that I had spoken with. And this is this last year who we had our experience with Sasquatch in a small town in Amanda Park. She was working in a, a logging as a mill there, sorting wood, and she had a car accident before it injured her hand. And she'd only been working there for about four months, and it was swelling that day, and the boss decided to send her home. To get to the Cornell Indian Reservation from Amanda Park is a short, uh, very bumpy backwards trail, like 25 miles. It's very small roads rather than go 40 miles around the other way than the hallways. And this woman, she left work and was crying because she thought she would lose her job. And she was driving, she was driving very slowly. And she noticed some deer go past her, and so she slowed down in the morning. She just happened to notice this deer. And she looked up, and she looked again, and there was this uh, tall creature that she thought was seven and a half, eight feet high and was dark. It was picking berries, so like 14 feet off the ground, it was picking these berries and eating them. And she said, he turned and looked at it very really nonchalantly and went back to picking the berries. And she said, I slammed that thing into the, uh, the park and I stared at it. She said, I was not going to go past because she was in her mother's 4x4 um, four four with a cloth top. And she was not going to mess with this thing. So she put it in reverse and took off and went back to the mill. And the people there said she, you know, she was very shook up. And she went 40 miles around that time. Well, when I found out about it, um, a friend I wanted to interview her at this place in the park and we went back there. And what was very interesting was that as we were getting close to the spot where she had this experience only two days before, um, first there was a coyote pacing back and forth at that particular spot that we were coming up to. And the closer we got to him, even though he was aware that we were coming, he was very nervous about going in at that spot where she had seen this um, Sasquatch. But he did go in, and then we also saw the same thing with a group of quail that were very nervously pacing up and down the road, and then we finally got close enough, they went in that spot also. 
So we knew before we even got there something taking place where she had seen the Sasquatch. And then when we got out of our vehicles to go in the area, this woman was just a nervous wreck, wasn't she? And she was she kept saying, Please, please don't do that. Please don't look near there. And we said that you just walk on, don't worry about it. I'm sure he's not a man. And she was very fretful. She had cousins with her that could help her not be quite so nervous. But eventually she did calm down long enough to go there and get a picture taken by this tree. <coughs> These experiences that people are facing are like, they say we're still having them. This hasn't ended. And I want to introduce Fred Bradshaw. Uh, he is a retired policeman from Grace Harbor. And I'd be more than happy to check with you a little bit more and tell you these experiences that he's had. If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments. Stay safe, stay well.